strange message today, very strange indeed. Um, and it's strange because it's a, it's a passage we've looked at many, many times. We're not strangers to it. Having to do with the life of Elijah, before you go somewhere, don't go too far ahead of me. Before you go somewhere, let me just say a few things. We often think our life is hammered out the way, oh, pretty much when we get to a certain age, we envision that our life will be pretty much kind of like it is, not too much uh, drama, right? <laughs> we get to a certain place, uh, even in the secular realm, we're told people make three career changes in their life. There are certain predictable things that will happen on a regular basis. But I wonder if this mindset could have stayed with the prophet Elijah. And I say that for a reason. We read of his story and the chronicle of his life. And yet, the last book of his life, the last chapter, is not written yet. See, a lot of times when, and I'm guilty of this, when I read the scriptures, I will read something and I never look beyond the moment to see God's not done. You know, I earnestly believe that uh, when we encounter, certainly, Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration, that passage where it says Moses and Elijah, and speaks of Moses and Elijah appearing there, I believe it's given to us to set Oh, a little diadem, a little stone, a little indicator of something. The witnesses that are recorded regarding Jesus' resurrection and ascension have much to do, I believe, with both Moses and Elijah. And of course, when Jesus speaks, even when he speaks of things, he says, on all these things, the law and the prophets, right? Focusing in who represents the prophets more than who is referenced, but Elijah and the law, but Moses. There's always these little sequential hints, these little clues that if we we'll look close enough, give light to something else. And I thought, you know, after the life that Elijah lived, and he was, as James says, a man of like passions, just as we are, with all of his ups and downs, great victories and terrible depression, wanting to kill himself, wanting to die under a tree, I thought, you know, the last chapter, to me, speaks of him in the book of Revelation. You can read it with me. I just thought, you know, when we think the last chapter has been written, it has not. Revelation 11 speaks of the two witnesses appearing. It says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the, go the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceed out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. If that's not speaking of Elijah, then I'm a flying saucer. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. If that's not referring to Moses, I can't say who else in God's book is recorded as doing such a thing. And believe me, uh, end times have been very much something that I've been chewing around as I've been tempted to go into the book of Revelation, although I must finish Galatians at some point. <laughs> but I found it interesting that the last chapter is not written to the fullest, that, I mean, we have this record in Revelation 11, but beyond that, the last chapter for this man Elijah has not been given, per se. It has not been fulfilled. I think that's also why when we read of Moses in the book of Jude and other places, really those telltale clues about why was it so important to wrestle over his body? It seems like if a body is laid down, then it's laid down. We, in the Christian frame of reference, say absent from the body, present with the Lord, but why this wrestling match if he is not to fulfill a greater task? And who will these two witnesses minister to if it not be those who look to the law and the prophets? Seems very, very logical and not complicated. So I thought, on all of this, I want to go back and look at Elijah for another reason. 
So follow me if you will. Uh, we may end up back again in Revelation at some point, the singular book, not the plural one. <laughs> Never mind, if you weren't around in the days when people used to say uh, the book of Revelations. <laughs> but I think there's only one of those books. Um, why I said indulge me, it seems like such a, a passage we've gone to many times before, but strangely enough, as I went back to this passage on Elijah, it seems as though there were at least five or six different messages that touched my heart that were there, and I said, okay, well, I guess I'll just have to choose one right now. But you know that First Kings, uh, beginning with chapter 17, begins with that conjunction and a strange way to begin a book, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, just marched right there before him, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now I want you to think about this. The end, I believe, has is pregnant with meaning, this small conjunction. I would say, in my opinion, having seen the seven evil kings that have uh, ruined the people and led the people into idolatry and the worshiping of everything under the sun, if you chronicle those, Jeroboam, Nadab, Baasha, Elah, Zimri, Omri, and Ahab, and each one, it says, and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And one was more evil than the next, and the next, and the next. And God had a time to raise up his spokesperson. And the interesting thing about Elijah, as we know, he was taken up in a chariot, never saw death. And we have no genealogy of him. We have nothing really to pinpoint. So when I say I believe Elijah and Moses are those two, at least Elijah fits the category perfectly well as one who his work is not yet completed for end times. My focus is not on end times, though. My focus is on something very simple. You know, as a person of God, as a pastor, and as a teacher, it would seem like my first mission would not be to march in front of Ahab, deliver this three-liner, and then be told, okay, now go. You know, you want the first speaking engagement here, his first public speaking engagement should be a long sermon, an hour long, with a lot of intricate passages woven together out of the Old Testament. There was no New Testament yet. But yet all that said here is that he marched into Ahab's court, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get thee hence, get out of here now. See, we have a corny idea of what good preaching is. Good preaching is if, in most churches, is, you know, 20 minutes is long enough. <laughs> Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion, right? Okay. But God gives him this just to go and make this pronouncement, turn around and leave. And I, I chronicled these. I pulled them apart, literally just as simple as this. As the Lord God of Israel liveth, so he believed in the living God. And God of Israel liveth, the covenant God of Israel, in whose presence I stand, which he believed that God was with him. And that for he was obedient to God's word. Seems I can't escape that right now. Obedience to the word. Now I mulled this over a little bit and I thought if it was me, I would expect something great and fabulous after these seven kings and he walks into the presence of the last one. I'd expect something great and marvelous, but God has got something in the mix. So Elijah speaks to me today not just for a history lesson, because I'm going to talk about how God's ways, if we really look at them, are so far removed from what we think God's ways are. You know, how many of you would like this? This is your first speaking engagement. Go in, make this proclamation, which we know way back there in Deuteronomy 11 is part of what God said would happen if they worshipped idols. You know the passage in Deuteronomy 11? Let's go there. Let's read it real quick. Only takes 
one minute of the 20. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Deuteronomy 11. This is all that God is promising from this entering into the new land. I'll just start at verse 14, because all that comes before is, is a great recognition of God's blessing. In verse 14 of that 11th chapter of Deuteronomy, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, first rain, the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn, wine, oil, send grass in thy fields for your cattle, that they may eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain. There was the promise right there and that the land yield not her fruit, and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. You know, such a strange promise for Elijah to go and make this proclamation, considering if you do a little math of how long it had been since God had given this word of promise, and how long they had been worshiping idols, and seemingly nothing had happened. This proclamation of God had not yet occurred. This is what I love about God's word. Today, he has not changed. He's still hastening his word to perform it. And even though we think there's nothing left to do, there's not a work being done, I can't see it, God is still acting and doing. He walks in and makes this proclamation. And then the Lord says, okay, now, get out of there. Go eastward. Go hide yourself by the brook Cherith. That's before Jordan. So bizarre, wait, I, I need to take a minute to talk about this. So bizarre is, think about, first of all, where he comes from, we don't really know, the, the Tishbite, Tishbi, it's a question mark, but Gilead we know. If you were standing in modern day Jericho looking east, you could see the mountains of Gilead. You could at least see. So to me, when we think of Elijah, we have some strange ideas of what Elijah must have been like. It's a mountain man. He wasn't a fancy man. He wasn't an educated man. We don't even know his, uh, his pedigree, where he came from, I mean, his lineage. And the, the, the best that we know is that he was a mountain man. I mean, think about that. Well, people, you know, if, if, if you really had a description of who this Elijah is, maybe you wouldn't want to follow a mountain man. No, I want to follow someone who comes from a good family or has a, you know, this guy doesn't even have a genealogy attached to him. He just appeared out of nowhere. No, I got to know that his dad was a preacher and his dad's dad was a preacher. I got to know everything they ever did, everything they ever ate. <laughs> got to know it all before I can follow the man of God. Right? Just thought I'd add that. It's such a bizarre thing. And God says to him, after he makes this declaration of God's word, God says, go hide yourself by the brook Cherith, that's before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now, let me stop there for a minute, because I could just do a message just about this and not go any further. This is how staggering this was to me. I began to look at all of the references in God's word regarding ravens. Well, the first one that comes to my mind is Noah's Ark dove and the raven being let forth, right? Which always makes me say that that was part of God's creation and it was part of what we consider to be an evil appearance creation, still nevertheless brought in the ark. And when Noah releases the raven, there's a staggering image to me that stays with me of, of carcasses floating on the water and this bird going to pick the flesh of these floating carcasses. That's what always comes to my mind when I think of the flood and the ravens. But there are other references too. Some of them are kind of gross. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not like, whoo, I feel good afterwards. And you read about the ravens. But one of them is Proverbs, and I had to write it down because I'm not a Proverbs person. Proverbs 30 and 17, where a rebellious child will be thrown in a valley and the ravens will pick out his eyes. Instead of being properly buried, the child is consumed. Ah. So this is the way this bird is viewed. Um, there's another passage in Isaiah where it says, after the destruction of Edom, only the owls 
and the ravens will live there. Kind of yucky. Song of Solomon talks about uh, the hair color, someone have it, having the hair color likened to that of a raven. And I could go on because there's a, a few other ones, but something staggering occurred to me as I was looking and researching this. Jesus even in Luke makes mention of the ravens and says, consider the ravens. Talk about Jesus talking about a yucky creature. He says, consider the ravens, for they neither reap nor sow. They don't have a storehouse or a barn, yet God makes provision for them, even those things. If you read in Leviticus 11, you find that ravens are part of the birds that are considered unclean by God. So I want you to think about this. I mean, as many times as I read this, I never stopped to think about this, that God is going to tell his man, his chosen vessel, go by a brook, that's where you're going to drink your water, and these birds are going to come and feed you, these unclean birds. Think about that. I mean, think about that. God's giving an instruction for a creature that he's already deemed dirty. I'd never really thought of that before. That's God using whatever he wants to accomplish his purpose. Furthermore, when it says the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening and he drank of the brook, think about what type of stuff is being brought to him. <laughs> Roadkill. <laughs> What's for dinner? Roadkill. <laughs> you know, we have, we have some strange glasses we put on when we read the Bible. Oh, the ravens fed him there. Oh, yes, we cut a, cut a fine piece for you today. This is the best cuisine we could offer to you, yes. And we'll just put it gently on the plate over here. No, they brought it in their beak. And I have a vision of him sitting by the brook and literally this food being dropped in front of him, just like garbage. Lord only knows where that, what thing that beak probed into to get that food. And the bread. Where, and I can understand the flesh. Where to get the bread? <laughs> to go bake it? <laughs> and I think, you know, that's so typical of God. To use something that is labeled dirty, and to accomplish his purpose. You know what this, it came to my mind as I was reading this. I'm going to, you stay where you are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you because the quote is a little bit strange. But out of um, 1 Corinthians, oh, you turn there if you want to. 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and 27 when it says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen. See, it's like God is always saying the same thing and doing the same thing, basically saying, I can feed you and provide for you the way I say. It may not be the filet mignon that you asked for, but I'm going to make sure that my children have. But the way I provide and how I provide I'm giving you a little subtle hint as to the way it's done here. Well, I don't like that. Well, neither do I, but that's the way it is. <laughs> Eat it or starve, right? If you really think about this, the image of him sitting by the brook, I thought to myself, what an amazing thing. In the New Testament, Jesus teaches his disciples, and he teaches them to ask for daily bread. Think about this. Whether Elijah was truly at the brook three and a half years, as James says, for three and a half years it didn't rain, whether he was there for three and a half years or a combination leading him to the widow's house, I sat and I said, wow, okay, let's just pretend for a minute that based on a 360-day calendar, not 365, that's ours. 360 would have been more closer to their calendar. Uh, so... 360, two times a day, times 3.5. Well, so that's somewhere in the ballpark of about 2,500 meals served. Think about that. I mean, when we read this, we tend to read this like, oh, and they, and he fed, and they fed him there. Okay. 2,500 meals. Guaranteed that each time the birds would bring and the servant would never go hungry. This is the problem with us. I think sometimes because we live in this materialistic world, we can never live by God's provision 
give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't say we're asked for weekly bread or monthly bread. And there's no record here of Elijah storing up. It was enough. Whatever could be carried in those birds' beaks, and trust me, we have raven, crow-like creatures that fly all over California. There are some big birds, and they have big beaks, but even as large a creature as they are, that's probably not sufficient for a man. But it was. It was enough. As I could stay here and camp out a little while and just look at this and say, you know, God uses a scavenger. It's kind of like the Chaldeans. God uses something that is disdainful and, and, and seen in a negative light to provide for his servant. How remarkable. Now it continues on with verse 7. It came to pass after a while. You'd be best to cross out the after a while. The Hebrew reads, at the end of days, at the appointed time. This is the marvel. You know, the King James can make it. Now, and it came to pass after a while. Uh-huh. No, no, at the end of days, at the appointed time, when God said, pulling the switch now, think about this, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. You know, for three, and I'm going to say that he was at that brook that time. We don't know, uh, we don't distinguish whether James was meaning to say by the time it rained, we know the battle at Mount Carmel and all of that, so it can bleed right over the three and a half years, whatever the case is. That's a whole lot of provision and a whole lot of drinking at a brook. We're not talking about a river. We have some areas that we would consider brook-like, and when they dry up, there just, might just be little pockets of water here and there until it completely dries up, and then it's just stones. All you see is just, it's just stones. There's nothing left. At the appointed time when God said, that's it, now, if it was me or you, I guarantee you, watching the brook dry up, we would have been saying, holy cow, what are we going to do now? <laughs> you know, without water, maybe without food, but without water, you're, you're toast. And I'm, I'm thinking of this as an absolute picture and type of the way God does things. He never says, I'm going to let you, you know, store up buckets for yourself here. He'll give instruction when that's the the case. But right here, the provision is daily, day by day. If, there's, if there is a lesson, forgive me, if there is a lesson in all this, it is God gives as we trust him for provision daily. That does not, it's not limited to sustenance. It's everything, our health, our strength, everything, daily. You know how much time I spend, I'll speak for me, thinking about and fussing about things tomorrow that, quite frankly, when tomorrow comes, it's like, ah, pff, big deal. But I spend all that time fussing about it daily. That means today's problems, today's issues, today's whatever it is going on today. Trust him day by day, daily. You know, if we could see as far as into eternity, and we had the ability from eternity to look back at this temporal moment in time. We'd say, God, we're such idiots. You know, if I only knew that all the provisions and all what God was going to provide and make good and allow for me, and I fussed over the things that God wasn't even bothered by, wasn't even going to provide for anyway. Hey, I have a word for you. Be careful what you pray for. <laughs> God, you know, God has not spoken to me, but I can tell you this. I prayed earnestly for something. And when it happened, I was surprised. <laughs> Think about that. That's how weird. OK, here we go. <laughs> you never know what's going to come out of my mouth. I just tell it like it is. The brook is dried up now. And I always liken this brook being dried up as God's signal of a season coming to a close and another opportunity opening up. And sure, of course, you've visited this with me. In verse 8, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Nice. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now listen, it's not bad enough, God, that you sent me down to this brook to be fed by birds, and that's crazy enough as it is. But now you're going to send me to this widow's house? No. Oh, what would you like? 
well, I, I think by this point in time, God, if you could provide me with a nice condominium and uh, secure income here so I'm not, you know, a widow. Hey, headlines in today's news, would, that would be a scandal if some person of God, a man or woman, said, oh, yes, the Lord told me to go and stay with you, a widow woman and her child. With bear, you know, headlines. I'm sure, and I give credit to the prophet, it just says, so he arose and went to Zarephath. That's better than you and me. Think about that. When we read this, not just flesh and blood put, being put on this, but I think of if it was me and God had already, oh, yes, he made good for me. It's like we never get to the point of saying God's going to keep providing and keep doing. No, no, no. I had the Raven Brook dry up experience. Thank you very much. I'm out of here. So he arose and went to Zarephath. I'm telling you, if he's a man with like passions, I like to be like Elijah because at least when God spoke, 99% of the time, he listened. That's a better track record than most of us here in this building. Yeah? Yeah. That's what I said. Came to the gate of the city. Behold, a widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. As she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel, morsel of bread in thine hand. Now, I give credit to this woman. She says, As the Lord thy God liveth, she at least had some recognition of this God. I have not cake, but a handful of meal. You know the story. Says, she says, I'm going to eat this, and then me and my boy are going to go die. That's faith, huh? <laughs> you know what? Please take a minute, because so often we read these, and we're so familiar. Please take a minute to identify with some of the things that we commonly do. As this woman said, I'm going to go gather sticks, enough for me and my boy, and go die. How many times have you encountered in this last week problems where you just said, oh, that's enough, and God's not going to do anything more, and we're toast? Don't raise your hands. I don't want to see them. <laughs> oh, don't want to know about it. <laughs> Oops, that one has a habit of going up there by itself. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. Make me there of a little cake first, bring it to me after make for thee and thy son. You know, that's a thing that the body of Christ today needs to reflect on. If a true person of God really has a recognition of their calling in life, they will always be putting God first and setting the example for people around them who may not have the understanding, God is first. God is preeminent. God's work and God's calling on a person's life, if that person be called, takes preeminence. Nowadays, somebody would say, this is not politically correct. Elijah should have said, feed your kid, feed yourself, and then if there's anything left over, you feed me. And he says, feed me first. You know. Complain to the King James people because, it, you know, it's their fault that this is not politically correct. <laughs> well, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Here it is again. There's that promise that he's calling up that has not been activated or made good on for so long, since the time of Moses. pretty, if you think about it, that's a pretty strong leaning on the fact that God's going to make good on his word. He not only says it to Ahab, he says it to this woman as well. It came to pass after these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. His sickness was sore. There was no breath left in him. She says, what'd you do? You come here to remind me of my sin? Now my boy's dead. He ends up dying. Again, I take time just to go through these things really slowly because for me, I redigested all these. You know, when people who come in the name of God, this is a gratuitous footnote, by the way, if they come to call, and, and by the way, he wasn't, but if they come to call and remind you of things that you may have done or said in the past and not first say, first of all, and out the gate, God's grace is sufficient. You know, if Christ can't remove the things of our past, and we all have a past. We all have a stained 
past, our childhood, the age of emancipation. There isn't a child in this house, not one person that can claim, I'm excluded from Romans 3.23. There isn't. And that's God's grace. Of course, this woman didn't understand. She thought, basically, it's a judgment of God. Her son has died. Anybody comes to you preaching condemnation, run. And run fast and run quickly. Because the same person's mouth who utters a word of condemnation to you has failed to even, it's the beam and the moat, by the way, which most Christians can never figure that out. They think all their job is they are the beam and moat inspectors for somebody else. Hi, I'm the representative of the beam and moat. <laughs> I'd like to tell you what's wrong with you today. I know a couple of those people, and they're constantly prodding at everything. And I really, I wish I, wish I had a, one of those portable mirrors. Every time they open their mouth, they're just... <laughs> Eric Clapton was right. He sang a song, Before You Accuse Me, Baby, Take a Look at Yourself. Yeah, he was right there. Anyway, now back to Elijah, of course. See, I can just make these swift transitions here. Of course, beautiful type of the power of God to resurrect the boy. There's uh, stretching himself out three times on the child, and the child comes back to life. It's a beautiful type. All of these, by the way, there's lots of types and pictures of Christ, the work of Christ being depicted. But uh, let me go down. The boy is now revived and everything's great. The woman said to Elijah, now by this I know. Now it's not enough for the provision that she only had two sticks and now she's got enough. No, by this I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in, in, in thy mouth is truth. And it came to pass, chapter 18, many days it says, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. So that gives you an indicator somewhere between the brook and here, the time that has elapsed. We read it in two chapters, and it's just two chapters. Three years has passed at least. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Now listen, if I was Elijah, I would say, I ain't going. We did this three years ago and nothing happened. Remember, this is how we started. This is why when we pray and we have petitions, we must be diligent and we must keep knocking. Three years for God to activate the initial process of him standing before Ahab and making that proclamation. Three years. I want it now. That's our generation. And no, I'm not proud of it. Trust me. Go show yourself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab. There was a sore famine in Samaria. And of course, we have this passage where Elijah encounters uh, Obadiah, which I'm not going to get into, except that it's got a, an interesting pattern to it, all of these things. Now, people talk about, was Obadiah a good man? Or was he a bad man? He certainly says he was a man who did the work of God because he hid those people in the cave and brought them bread and water to sustain them so that they wouldn't be killed. But he's not our subject for today. In the process of encountering him, Elijah encountering Obadiah, he says, you go tell, Ob you go tell Ahab, I'm alive. You've seen me and know I won't run away. I'll present myself. In fact, here's this great orchestration of what's going to happen. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. He's now changed it, by the way, to the Lord of hosts. The one that does fight our battles for us, that arranges like an army military, can use the stars, can use any inanimate or animate object. Now changes it to the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. I will surely show myself on him today. Speaking of Ahab, he wouldn't run away. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? I love this. Are you the one making all this trouble? And he answered, 
I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, for you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and hast followed Balaam. You know, that's the other thing, is that people can never see when they are off track. I'm sorry if I too, do these little sidebars, it's because I read these things. People who are not following Christ, who may think they are because they're following another God, it may be the God of their belly, it may be the God of their mind, the God of their pocketbook, are always going to be off kelter and off color, just off focus a little bit. Hey, you're the troublemaker. You know how many people I've met who have ignorantly said things because they don't know any better, and they'll make comments about Martin Luther. Now, to me, Martin Luther is not only thank God for Martin Luther and his activities, his mindset, everything that befell him, because we would not probably be here as Protestants otherwise. But how many people I've met in sheer ignorance will make comments about Martin Luther? Oh, what an evil man, how he, how he did these things. And I said, wait a minute, excuse me, Who's, who is evil here? Was it just that we should all march and file and, and keep our, mo our mouths shut while the church, the then holy Catholic church, lead people into a, di a deeper ditch to tell people that they can pay to have their loved ones released from hell or purgatory? They had a good gig going on. Thank God for Martin Luther. Thank God for men with a like mind who came and said, no, this is not the right way. But it's always those people who can never get the focus right. They're not following Christ. And by the way, if you are following Christ, I guarantee you one thing. The world is always going to come against you. There's not going to be an exception. It may not be as uh, prevalent, depending on how your placement is and what you're doing, but trust me, anyone who is leaning and pointing in the direction, answering the call to follow him, or if you're following me as I follow Christ, trust me, the world thinks you're a troublemaker. <laughs> Brother, go status quo. Let's go with the flow. Don't disrupt things. We've got a good gig going on here. No, listen, I have a Christian interview going on right here. So tell me how you made your fortunes. Now, tell me how. It's, it's always like that. Run! And run quickly! You know, all of it, I've said this before, the scripture is very clear. God will not tempt us beyond what we're able. And with the temptation, whatever that is for each person, he provides a way of escape. He provides a door for us to walk through. And I'm thinking, wow, I wonder how many doors have never been even opened where people have not even gone into the Bible to say, I'll walk through that door because that's what was given to me as an escape route. I shouldn't say escape, but a safety route, if you will. These are the people that come against the people of God. Why are you troubling us? No, 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 no. The answer is the other way around. Why are you troubling us? It's Elijah, I, I like what he says. And he calls them on the mat. See, Ahab just said, are you, are you the one that's troubling Israel? And he says, I haven't troubled Israel, but you and your father's house in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed a God, which is not another God, Balaam. See, I can read all these things and see even the Apostle Paul looking at what he confronted in his day. It's the beauty of Scripture. It confirms itself. Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Karma, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves of Ashereth, 400. That means 850. Here are my odds. 850 to one man of God plus God. Right? That's a good... You know, if you've ever looked at that Mount Carmel, which overlooks what is modern-day Haifa, you'll notice one thing. If you were to go back in time, Anybody who controlled that mount would have the military power because it got a great view. It's, it's a great view to see everything all the way around. And whoever controlled that mount spiritually controlled the nation. So not only is this uh, fight that's going to take place or ensue, display of powers, important, but who ultimately wins out determines what will happen with that land. 
You know the story. I mean, I just, all of this to me, every single way has great, powerful lessons for us. Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. Verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? Yeah, King James is kind of poo-poo, but two thoughts. If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. You know, I think I'm going to just say this just as plain as day. If God is God, then serve him. You know, we, we're reticent to, to reach in and take from Jesus' words of him quoting out of Deuteronomy, of him speaking his own words, essentially, the commandment to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, all of our total being. And you look at what's being said here. If God is God, follow him. And, and if the other God is your God, follow that God. Make a decision. That really should be the message to the church. And if we're looking at Elijah's life as an example, Elijah was not perfect, but he did follow God. And when God said, go, except for one occasion, he went. That's the problem. I think, let me summarize it like this. There is an identity crisis within the body of Christ. People cannot figure out that following Christ does not look like the world. And the world has become the Balaam, if you will, the Baal of anything that can be engrafted on to then deify that and follow it. It is why, folks, when I spoke, and at some point I'll bring it up again and talk more about it, about how Christianity today looks more like Buddhism than Christianity of the Bible. You'd be better off if you can't, I'm sorry, forgive me, it's kind of crass, but if you can't look to this word and say, this is my example for me to walk by faith and appropriate the things I cannot see versus the orthopraxy, the, the practicing of exterior works, good words, good speaking, good thoughts. You know, it's, it's all the path of Zen that leads you to nirvana where you escape the pain of this world into a different arena where you have peace. And the life raft that brought you to that shoreline of peace is now discarded. We as Christians must, must keep hold of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of his words, and of the life we live by faith. There's no discarding the life raft. There's no time where the waters will abate and everything will become calm again. Intermittently, intermittently, he brings and calms the winds. But there are storms in our life. This word at least tells me even for the great prophet Elijah. Yes, give me a word, make me feel good, because I know I, I'm on the cusp of something good, and I, I just know it. Okay. After this great battle, which is not a battle. You know, imagine this. They set up their gods, and it's like a showdown, right? They got their gods, and they, now they're, they're calling out, you know, their, their God, come, come now, come and help us. Well, they're calling out to nothing because it doesn't exist anyway, right? Calling out, calling out. He says here, call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. That's the difference. We are so, we have such a great luxury and such a great blessing to know we call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we call, and he does not ever have a deaf ear towards us. Think about that. He says, you call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the, of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. Ha, 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 all right. All the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Good. Glad you agree with me on this. Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves. Dress it, for you are many, and then call on the name of your gods, but put no fire. Yeah took the bullock which was given them, they dressed it, called on the name of Baal from morning, even until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. Now, you know, you can read this and only see it with the eyes of what's going on, or you can read it with the eyes and make an application today. Oh, my 
money, oh pocketbook, oh bank account, save me. Forgive me, but I not only, I not only read this, but I have a day application, day to day for myself. Replace whatever it is, bail, forgive me, I repeat myself, but bail can be in our lives, can be we worship and idolize money, we deify our family. Family comes first. Do you know what? In a Christian home, and forgive me for saying this, but in a Christian home, Jesus Christ must come first preeminently. Before, before we decide what a family unit is, a family unit cannot exist if the head of the household does not recognize that without the power of God, without the power of Jesus Christ to keep that family a family and bless it and keep it by putting him first in all things, that family will fail. I don't care. Listen, I don't care what statistics you want to read. I see more statistics in front of me. And I can tell you every single time, it always, it always happens the same way. It begins with either backsliding or things that what I call bail. They are the things that interfere and wedge their way in. If you let them. Listen, we're not called to live in a monastery, all right? We're called to live more abundantly, but the recognition is that our living, even our daily living, I'm bought with a price. Now, as bad as this is going to sound, most folks walk around acting like they bought themselves. So they're free to do what they want. And let me tell you something, you have plenty of freedom Plenty with that mindset while you're trying to find your way out of the fiery furnace of hell. That's, that's pretty brutal, isn't it? But that's the truth. You can either acknowledge now I am bought and paid for. He owns me. He loved me enough. He loved me enough to die for me, to give me the hope of life eternal and to give me this life that I have more abundantly now. Oh, help me, please, because it's just too difficult for me to come to the recognition that somebody did that for me. Therefore, I'm just going to keep going on, you know, listen, I'm on my own time zone here, you know. Uh, I, I march by my own drumbeat. Um, there's going to be a lot of drumbeats somewhere else that you'll get to follow. Yeah, pastor's into preaching about heaven and hell a little bit. Yeah, it's the other missing message of the church. Not too many folks want to brush that off and say, not for me. I live now. Well, good. And that's probably all you're going to get with that mindset. How many, I don't, I don't think I have to make anybody uncomfortable. How many know the breath of eternity is already on you? The breath of eternity is already on you. That shouldn't be like, oh, there's a gloom and despair. <laughs> no. Thank God, because I now live my life in joy, the fulfillment of this life, and what is yet to come, which I, I, all I know is what I read, what I'm told. And it looks pretty good because at least there I'm told no sorrow, no pain, no suffering. Hello, hello, hello. Yes. That's pretty good. Oh, I don't know how we got there, but it's okay. Now listen, after all this ruckus is going on, they leaped upon the altar. And it came to pass at noon. Elijah mocked them, said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he's pursuing, or he's in a journey. Listen, I read the Hebrew, and one of those words actually double plays on he's in the bathroom. <laughs> I read that, and I had, to, I had to look up in every lexicon to make sure. Is that possible? Yeah, it is. You're never going to forget this. I promise you. <laughs> if he ain't there, don't worry about it. I read this and I said, you know, we have colloquial terms for a lot of things, but... <laughs> okay. 
came to pass at noon, Elijah mocked them. That's what I said. Cry aloud, for he's a God. He's either talking, or he's pursuing, or maybe he's pottying. He's in a journey. For adventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. They cried aloud. They cut themselves after them with knives until blood was flowing. It came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering, the evening sacrifice. There was no voice, no answer. Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. You know the story. He makes a trench. This is the wettest sacrifice we've ever seen. He just wanted to make sure that when God acted, there'd be no doubt. Now listen, take this from a man who got fed by ravens and was told to drink from a brook. Take this from a man who's told to go live with a widow, with provision, and revives his son. Take this from a man who's seen a lot now, so I think I'm going to rest in the fact the lessons of Elijah are very simple. God's working. God is still working. God has not stopped working. If we'll just listen and be obedient to what's being said, you know how this comes out. I love this. Built the trench, and then, of course, the water round about all the altar filled the trench with water. Verse 36 came to pass. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Three things he lists here. That you're the God in Israel, you are the God, I'm your servant, and you're doing all these things at your word so that no one will make a mistake that they might think, oh, Elijah, he, he spoke and it was, confusing him for a God. He had so much respect and reverence for God, he wanted to make sure that every ear that could hear would understand. Living God, I'm his servant, and all these things are being performed by his word. Good preaching, real good preaching. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Wow, you mean he actually said something likened to maybe you'll heal them. You know, I could do something with that. Hey, how come when Elijah went into Ahab's court for the first time and told him about the rain, how come he didn't say, now let me minister to you and try and convert you? If you'll just follow me in this small prayer, King Ahab, I can turn your life around completely. Something happened and now I know. He just prays for these people. When he's speaking to God, hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and, I like this, licked up the water that was in the trench. Look, I like the English. Hebrew does not sound that fancy. Licked up the water. While all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Great here. Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. He took them all and killed them all. So just before you get to see the power of God, now I've, we have had a display of who this one true living God is and all his power. You're toast. See ya. See, now you could say, well, that's Old Testament, and that's not, that's not real good because God doesn't work that way anymore. No, you know, listen, God has every generation. He gives opportunities for each generation to hear. He brings speakers to speak and proclaim in each generation. And every opportunity is afforded to any person who will and can't hear. Not just who will, but who can. Remember last week's lesson. Of course, now... 
after all this time, the moment you've all been waiting for, verse 31, Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there's a sound of abundance of rain. The rain wasn't even coming yet. There's just a sound. The sound of rain. Now listen, all of this will mean nothing. You know, you'll just say to me, I, I might have been entertained for about an hour and feel like, you know, uh, a little bit lighter than when I came in the door. I want you to catch the essence of this. This is still the same way that God expects us to act on his word as though, even though it's not happening just yet, it will happen. Whatever your need is, and I am not going to bring some damnable heresy that you can reach in a pot and pull out the thing you need at random. You go into the scriptures. You find the thing that is needed for you today. And you claim that thing that you need, that verse of scripture, today, today, with today's faith, not yesterday's and not looking back and reminiscing about, oh, you know, 10 years ago the Lord answered my prayers and I'm going to use that same thing now, this 10 years later. Today, today's faith. And you know what? We're complacent. Even though most of you have all been taught the life of faith, you slip every now and then, go back either leaning on the arm of the flesh and depending on some circumstance to make it happen instead of God. You've heard Dr. Scott talk about F.B. Meyer saying the lessons of Elijah, learning to trust the giver of the gifts instead of the gifts themselves. No better utterance, no better proclamation could be made, except here I'd put a footnote and say one thing. Elijah acted as though God would do it. He acted like, you know what, that's what, that is the missing ingredient of faith. People say, well, I believe and have confidence, but it's the action part of it. He acted as though God would make it good, and here we go. There's a sound of abundance, of the abundance of rain. Ahab went up to eat and drink. Elijah went up to the top of Mount Car of Carmel. He cast himself down upon the earth, put his face between his knees. Now, if that's not a position that everyone's going to go emulate right now, please... What's he saying here with his head between his knees? What's he saying with his head between his knees? Go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and he looked. He said, there's nothing. Go again seven times. <laughs> Can you see anything? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. You're going to see some nutcase on religious TV assuming that position <laughs> to invoke a blessing from God. Seven times. Now, I have, I'm going to have trouble getting through this one passage right here. And it came to pass <laughs> that at the seventh time he said, Behold! <laughs> oh, boy, help us here. Help me out here, God. Behold, there ariseth a little cloud. <laughs> He wasn't looking at him. He was looking up in the sky. There's a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. Are you sure? My. He said, Go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Came to pass, in the meanwhile, the heavens, black clouds, wind, there was a great 
rain. After all this time, see, I could stop here and I could say, wow, see, if you really believe this book, and I just happen to really believe this book, it took that long for God to make good on what he said way, way back there. But he made good. It gives me the hope and the encouragement, all kidding aside, that God is not only able, but he will. It just takes me to activate these promises and say, I'm claiming this faithfully. And I keep like, listen, after three plus years, you'd think he would have said, oh, give it up. No rain. And by the way, why, why Baal? Why Baal? Baal was many, many, many things, but considered the god of fertility. This is why this victory is so great. If, he's the, if Baal was the god, many gods of fertility, then also was believed to be the god who brought rain and the abundance of crop, which just proved the point that this deified thing that wasn't a god wasn't a god at all. Another, God didn't need to be vindicated, but another proof of God's touch on showing he is the true living God. Now, the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. He girded up his loins, ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. And of course, you know, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. With all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by the... In other words, she says, I'm going to kill you. You're dead. This is what's staggering to me. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. By the way, it says, when he saw that, when he heard of this, he arose and went for his life. God didn't tell him to go anywhere, by the way. This is why it said 99 times. God didn't tell him, go and flee for your life. The same God that brought the rain, the same God that brought the provisions, the same God that gave the word. This is what happens when we act with our ideas. He arose and fled. And look where he ends up. A day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. Said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life away, for I'm not, not better than my father's. Now, real long-winded, but to say this, one, after every great victory of God, we've seen it with this church, we've seen it in our personal lives, after every great victory, there'll be some moment like this. You know why? Because you can't stay on the mountaintop forever. You can't stay in the victory zone forever. And this is the ever-increasing problem with Christianity. Everyone wants that mountaintop experience no one wants to look at what I call this truly being. This is a blessed man going through a valley of weeping in a moment. For what? Not from God, but for a woman. And you can substitute that woman for anything else in your life that's not of God or that's driving you away from God. He's under a tree wanting to die. Now, please don't show me hands. I don't want to see the hands. I know what it's like to be in this mode of saying, God, I'm just blot me out. I've been there. I know what it's like. You can't see a bright or anything. All you see is darkness. And I love this. There's been no point until this time where God does something as blatant, as clear, it's the only time where God makes a provision, sends an angel that touches him and says, arise and eat. He doesn't say, go make another proclamation. You know, there are plenty of good helps in here. This man's depressed. What's the first thing you're going to do if you're depressed? Not eat. He says, arise. The angel comes to him, arise and eat. You mean, not pray? If the angel comes to him, it's got to be spiritual. Arise and pray. No, arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals, a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Second time, the Lord came again. The second time, angel of the Lord touched him, arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. He did, and he went 40 nights and 40 days unto Horeb, the Mount of God. You know what? I could go beyond this, but I'm going to save... This is a part two for another lesson. In fact, there's probably another 
five or ten lessons in here, but just this. If you have come to the place in your life, maybe you're finding yourself a little bit where we are now marching to the same pattern, both of us as you are walking with me. And you find it's almost like, well, God did all these great things back here, but I'm now finding that it's a little tougher now. But the same God is here. The same God is still leading you. The same God, by the way, is still providing for you and still feeding you and still taking care of you. Let's you keep the portion that you retain after you put and give what is his to him. Think about that. Now, I want to speak to only maybe a handful of people today that are so down in their spirit that they can't even look back to see the victories that God has won for them. And God will ultimately point out, don't think you're the only one. If you're in that state today, don't think you're the only one that's so downcast in your spirit that you can't seem to get up. In fact, I was going to do, I had another message. God probably wanted me to do this for maybe one person. There was another message I had prepared for. Same essence. Usually when you can't get away from something, it's because somebody really needs it. So downcast, so depressed, so discouraged, so full of failure. For what purpose? And by the way, it brings me back to spiritual warfare. You know, there's no greater tool that the devil will use than when you are at rock bottom. And there's no greater tool that God will use when you recognize that when you're at rock bottom, there's only one way to go, and that's up. Now, the devil will come with a shovel and dig a little bit deeper so you can think you're falling just a little bit more into the abyss of no man's land. The lesson today, at least if I can summarize and put it all together, you know, it takes a while for this hard head to get it in my brain. If Elijah could act as though God's word and God's honor were at stake, and sometimes I feel like, God, I'm claiming this now, and I expect it to happen. How long have I been claiming this thing? I haven't waited as long as Elijah, three years. I haven't waited as long as Abraham. I haven't waited as long as the woman with the issue of blood, 30-some years, eight. See what I'm saying? Because we have this tendency, it's so easy to fall away from what we cannot see and quit acting on God's word. The, the, the whole lesson of Elijah was to demonstrate one thing. If you are following any place else except in God's pattern, yeah, maybe your roads will be a little bit smoother. Maybe there'll be better things that you might think are better for you, but God's got a plan for your life, and he's not going to change that plan if you will just act in faith and believe that he is the same God, the God of Elijah. Now, you know, all of this lesson tells me one thing. As if it wasn't enough, God then says, listen, I've got 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. You're not the only one out there. In other words, get off of it. Get up. Get back up in faith. In fact, he sends him to anoint three people after this passage. You're not the only one out there suffering. You're not the only one out there putting yourself out for the kingdom of God. Neither am I and neither are you. Stay the course. Look to this example today and say, if you're in the case of the juniper tree experience, or perhaps that you've been waiting for rain in your life, and I'm not talking about spiritual downcastness either, the black cloud event. I'm talking about waiting for God's provision for something. Keep waiting in faith. Keep claiming God's word. You know, when God appeared, it wasn't in the earthquake, the later passage proclaims. It wasn't in the earthquake, and it wasn't in the fire. It wasn't in anything except that still, small voice. Guess what? It's still that way today. Anyone who says God's come out with the marching band and the parade, and he's announcing himself to make known to you that he's finally arrived in your life, <laughs> take your pulse. This is what happens. For the true sensitive heart to God, looking to him, waiting on him, that still small voice. I don't have to go any further than this except to say if you're in the state 
of having given up, if you're in the state of almost letting go, if you're in the state where you cannot see under a juniper tree all the victories that God has already won, look to Elijah, lift your eyes up, and say, this is the same God still with me. Guess what? Elijah's work is not over. I believe that in the end time. He will be the one with Moses as the two witnesses. Guess what? You think after all that life and all of the ups and downs, God say, here, take a load off your feet. Elijah, kick back for a while. <laughs> for God, the work is never over. And the life of faith never ceases. We do live from faith to faith. Take the lesson today of Elijah. Let it be grafted into your heart. And let this powerful image of God's servant be a reminder for us. Don't become complacent. If you have a need today, don't act individually and stand under your juniper tree feeling sorry for yourself, but get up in faith and say, God, I'm claiming your word of promise for me. I'm claiming strength. I'm claiming healing. Whatever your need is, you claim it and you act on it and you wait that God's word will eventually be activated in your life and he will make it come to pass. That's his message. That's his message. I'm done. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.